more than a million students graduate from public high schools each year as functional illiterates. A national commission reported in 1983, quote, if an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre educational performance that exists today, we might have viewed it as an act of war, unquote. What has happened to American education? Who's behind this attack on our children, and what can we do about it? The public education establishment is hoping that you won't listen to this tape, and that if you do listen, that you won't do anything about it. That would spoil everything they have in mind for you and your children. The lecture you're about to hear was presented in Topeka, Kansas on the evening of Saturday, November 1st, 1986, and features Samuel L. Blumenfeld, educator, author, and lecturer. Mr. Blumenfeld is a graduate of City College in his native New York City with studies in France and 10 years as an editor in the New York book publishing industry. He is taught in public and private schools, including a school for learning and behavioral problems. He has written extensively on educational topics. One of his six books was described by Fortune magazine as brilliant revisionist history. His latest book, titled NEA Trojan Horse in American Education, became such a hit it went into its third printing in a matter of weeks. Mr. Blumenfeld's writings have appeared in many diverse publications, including Esquire, Reason, Education Digest, Child and Family, The Reading Informer, and many others. He has participated in many educational conferences on the national level, and he has frequently appeared on radio and TV programs across America. And now, Samuel L. Blumenfeld confronts the question, Are public schools harming your children? I do want to welcome the teachers who may be here tonight because I know that they have borne the brunt of the criticism uh, that uh, has uh, been directed at public education in America. Uh, and the uh, teachers, of course, are the most visible representatives of that system. Actually, they don't control the system, they don't write the textbooks, they don't choose the curriculum. They're often at a loss to um, do the best job they can simply because they're not provided with suitable materials. It's the professors of education who basically decide what is to be taught in American public schools. And very few of us know who those people are, who they are. If you want to find out what the professors of education are saying, you have to read what they write. And they don't write for People magazine. They don't write for, uh, for Cosmopolitan. Uh, if you want to know what the professors are talking about, you've got to read journals of education. And to get a journal of education, you've got to go to your local university. I, I imagine you'd have to travel to Lawrence and get up there in the shelves and the periodicals and then hunt down those journals of education. And then you would finally find out what these men are talking about. And so uh, I, I hope that the uh, teachers will bear with me as I expose uh, the... Uh, the problems of public education and will not feel that I am uh, attacking them as, as someone as the NEA likes to pretend that I am. I have great respect for teachers. I remember my public school teachers with great fondness and affection and I certainly know that there are many fine teachers in the public schools today. As a matter of fact, I, I met three of them last night who were teaching in Topeka schools and they're or in the area schools, and they certainly are very fine individuals. Now, the, the subject at hand, probably the, the problem that uh, concerns us most, uh, most about public education these days is this whole business of, of uh, our growing population of illiterates. I mean, we read about it all over the place, of the uh, number of illiterates that we have in our society and that they are growing. For example, in May, Time Magazine published an article entitled, Losing the War of Letters. Did you know we were involved in a war of letters? A war? My heavens, well, what are the two sides in this war? I mean, is, is illiteracy an enemy? I mean, is it, can you shoot at illiteracy? But nevertheless, they call it a war of letters. A government study finds that one of eight Americans cannot read. We are creating a new generation of illiterates. 
He said that we're in the process of creating a new generation of illiterates. So the, the inference there is that things are going to get better, I mean worse. Then they had, a, then uh, Time had another article, a debate over dumbing down. The fact that our textbooks uh, have, been re have, made, have been made so simple, uh, so comic book-like that uh, the nation is in a sense uh, reflecting this, the education system is reflecting this dumbing down uh, situation. And of course, you might ask yourself, how come we have all of these illiterates? You know, I'm sure you've seen them on television. ABC and, and, and PBS have done quite a number of documentaries on them, and you generally are shown interviews with these functional illiterates, and of course, what they try to convey to you is uh, how awful it is to be illiterate in America. And uh, you go through the, the, the traumas that these poor individuals have gone through, having gone to school, through school, some of them having actually graduated from high school, and then having had to pretend that they could read, and bearing the shame of illiteracy for so many years, and, and uh, uh, how it has really limited their horizons. Some of them never even go out of the house because they're afraid they may be in a situation where they may have to read something and be embarrassed. And you ask yourself, well, generally the, the, the program asks the question uh, about why they became illiterates, uh, generally in the last five minutes of the program. Uh, they spend you know, 55 minutes telling you how awful illiteracy is, and then at the last five minutes they say, gee, how come these people are illiterate? They all went to school, didn't they? And then they ask the, uh, the, the victims, they ask them, why are you, how come you, you didn't learn to read in school? And so usually the answers are pretty preposterous. Somebody will say, well, I was absent from school the day they taught reading. <laughs> Or, um, oh, well, I, I had a, uh, uh, a learning disability. Or, um, uh, my parents didn't read to me at home. Uh, some lame excuses, they're never very convincing, but then the, usually the, the uh, television interviewers just dismiss it and then go on to something else or end the program and, and just tell us that we've got to spend more money and we've got to get all these volunteers to wipe out uh, adult illiteracy. Well, it's interesting that uh, uh, they never uh, really deal with the problem of why we have all of this illiteracy. Because after all, look, we have public schools in America. Every single city, town, and hamlet has a free public school. Uh, if you don't live near a school, they'll even put you on a bus and make sure you go there. So certainly, it can't be that there are not enough schools available. And then we have compulsory school attendance. Everybody has to go to school in America. I mean, if, if you don't go to school, they'll put you in a, a home for delinquent children. If your parents don't send you to school, they'll lock them up or, ta or fine them. Uh, we've got plenty of teachers, certified teachers in the schools, doing supposedly the, an adequate job. I mean, you can't teach in a public school unless you've gone to college and have had four years of training uh, in a teacher's college and um, uh, have a degree and are certified by the state. And then, of course, the system is, is very well supervised. We've got superintendents, administrators, professors of education, graduate schools of education, departments of education, commissioners of education. Nothing that goes on in the schools from a point of view of curriculum uh, is accidental. Everything is very thoroughly planned. Everything is planned. Nothing happens accidentally in in, uh, in the public school. So there's plenty of supervision, and incidentally, these, all of these supervisors get very good salaries for their jobs. Administrators, principals, professors of education are very well-paid individuals. And then, of course, we're doing plenty of research as far as education is concerned. We've got thousands of scholars on all sorts of grants and universities doing research in education. And as a matter of fact, the teaching of re reading is the most researched subject in education today. So there's plenty of research being done. And well, then you might say, well, maybe we're not spending enough money on education. I can assure you 
that we're, that there's more than enough money to teach reading. I mean, yes, maybe there's not enough money to do everything the educators want to do, but then there's not enough money for anybody to do everything he or she wants to do. I mean, uh, I don't have enough money, you don't have enough money, of course the schools don't have enough money, but they have more than enough money to teach children to read. You can be certain of that. You go into any school building in America, any elementary school building, and you see a very well-built uh, uh, edifice with, with spacious lunchrooms and cafeterias and all sorts of games and, and equipment. And of course the rooms are decorated with all sorts of um, cartoons and, and there are plenty of books. Uh, recently when I was in Grand Island I visited the school just prior to um, Halloween and there wasn't an inch of the wall that had not been pasted over with some cartoon or some witch or a skeleton or a pumpkin or you know they've got plenty of money for that apparently so they've got money money is not the problem well then you might ask well if we've got all of that how can we have all of this illiteracy well if you ask the educators why we have this all of this illiteracy at this time, they will look at you with a straight face. And this is generally the professors of education and some of the teachers, and they will look at you in this, with a straight face and they would say, well, the reason why we have all of this functional illiteracy in America today is because thousands and thousands of American women are giving birth to defective children. That's why. You see, they're giving birth to children with all of these learning problems, these, these learning disabilities, particularly this thing called dyslexia. That's the reason why I have this. Nothing wrong with the schools, nothing wrong with the books, nothing wrong with the reading programs, it's the children's fault. And then of course they say, and of course there's television, that does it, the Vietnam War, uh, nuclear fallout, uh, any number of reasons that they can possibly think of that the public will accept. And that's the reasons why we have all of this illiteracy today. And to give you an idea of how this wisdom has filtered down to the popular media, last October while traveling on a Delta airliner, I picked up a copy of their magazine, Sky Magazine, which they put in the pockets of their seats. And in it was a lead article on the reading problem entitled Dealing with Dyslexia. So I thought, well, I mean, I've been dealing with this, this, uh, this problem for over 20 years, so I wanted to find out what the latest is about dyslexia. Maybe this article would, would tell me. Maybe, they, maybe the author knew something that I didn't know. Well, the first thing that the author does is, is describe what dyslexia is, and he says that it's one of the most misunderstood, misdiagnosed, and underestimated of the learning language disorders. So you see, we're dealing with a rather mysterious condition. And then they, dis then they define dyslexia as a disorder manifested by difficulty in learning to read despite conventional instruction. Now, conventional instruction covers a multitude of sins. Adequate intelligence and sociocultural opportunity. Well, what that means is that you can be rich and smart and still be dyslexic. And probably the most famous example of such an individual was the late Nelson Rockefeller, who was very rich, somewhat smart, and quite dyslexic. Had he become president, we would have had the first functional illiterate in the White House. <laughs> but you know, uh, Pref uh, Nelson Rockefeller told us why he couldn't read. It was no mystery to him. He said the reason why he couldn't read was because he went to a progressive school and they didn't teach him to read. It was as simple as that. You see, his father, John D. Rockefeller Jr., contributed $3 million to the experimental Lincoln School at uh, Teachers College, Columbia University. And uh, to get something for his money, he put four of his sons in that school. Uh, three of them came out functionally illiterate. Uh, Nelson, of course, uh, he, he was joked about his inability to read. Nelson, uh, uh, Lawrence Rockefeller bemoaned it, and Winthrop Rockefeller did so poorly that he had to drop out of college. But of course he went on to become governor of Arkansas. You see, you can be functionally illiterate and still become governor of a state, provided you have enough money. 
Now, the, the, uh, this particular article is interesting because the author found a very fascinating lady by the name of Elizabeth Fleming. Now, she's interesting because she has had five dyslexic children. And she calls her family the perfect dyslexia lab. And she's even written a book about it. I mean, wouldn't you if you had five dyslexic children? And this is what she says about dyslexia. I feel that dyslexia is a progressive hereditary trait, one that is increasing in the human population. More and more dyslexics are being are diagnosed every year. In the United States, an estimated 10% of the children entering kindergarten are being diagnosed dyslexic. In these days of growing anxiety that modern man may not be able to keep up with the information explosion and technological advances made during this century, I suggest that man need not fear. Perhaps hereditary dyslexics are the new breed of man, an evolutionary species that does not live in a world of up-down, right-left, but rather in the multi-dimensional or non-dimensional world of space. Can this be called the age of dyslexia? Asks Mrs. Fleming. Well, if we're in the age of dyslexia, I don't know how we're going to handle the age of information. Because according to John Naisbitt, you know, in Megatrends, he tells us that we're now in the age of information. But according to Mrs. Fleming, we're in the age of dyslexia. And mind you, we're, we've now, we're now dealing with a new breed of man. An evolutionary species, how do you like that? A genetic mutation, if you will. Isn't that interesting? You know, when I studied evolution back in, uh, back in college, they told us that in evolution, things are supposed to get better and better. People are supposed to get smarter and smarter. How come in this case, they're getting dumber and dumber? And how come this evolutionary trend has only hit the United States? It's, it's gone completely around Iceland. <laughs> and it's avoided the Soviet Union. You see, in the Soviet Union, they don't have dyslexia. Anyone who goes to school learns to read there. It's the same in Iceland. If you go to school, you learn to read, you see. They have 99.9% .9 literacy in Iceland. We found out all about that, you know, during that Reykjavik summit, and they told us about how literate everybody was in Iceland. And yet here in the United States, where we spend much more money on education than Iceland, little Iceland, and we have far greater facilities, great universities, great teachers' colleges, great professors of education, we have, we're endangered by a new generation of illiterates. How do you like that? Well, poor Mrs. Fleming, the only problem with her is that she's ignorant. <laughs> What she's written here is total, utter nonsense. You see, we know why we have a reading problem. We've known it for over 30 years. We've known it ever since Dr. Rudolf Flesch wrote a very famous book that was published in 1955, Why Johnny Can't Read. Has anyone heard of that book in this room? Do you realize that Why Johnny Can't Read was published 31 years ago? And what did Dr. Flesch tell us in that book? He said, look, Americans, there's nothing wrong with your children. They haven't suddenly become afflicted with all kinds of learning disorders. He said, the reason why they're not learning to read is because they're using this ridiculous, stupid method of teaching children to read, this look-say method. And this is how he described it. He said, the teaching of reading all over the United States, in all the schools, in all the textbooks, is totally wrong and flies in the face of all logic and common sense. And then he explained that in the early 1930s, the professors of education changed the way reading is taught in American schools. They threw out the alphabetic phonics method, which is the proper way you teach children to read an alphabetic writing system, and they put in a new method, a look-say, whole word, or sight word method that teaches children to read English as if it were Chinese an ideographic writing system. Now, you may not know the difference between an alphabetic and an ideographic writing system. I will explain that to you. But first, let me explain the difference between a simple illiterate and a functional illiterate. 
A simple illiterate is someone who never went to school and never learned to read. Now, we don't have too many of those these days because everybody goes to school. Even uh, immigrants to this country have all gone to school in their countries because compulsory school attendance is now practically universal in, in every country of the globe. Uh, so we don't have many simple illiterates anymore. A functional illiterate, however, is someone who has spent from as many as 8 to 10 to 12 years in a school and has emerged at the end of the process with reading skills so dismally, uh, abysmally low, so deficient that for all practical purposes they might as well be illiterate. You see, you have to go to school to become a functional illiterate. <laughs> and American schools now specialize in producing functional illiteracy. illiteracy. And it isn't easy. Uh, you need special books. You need special training programs for the teachers. And you need special reading programs. Teachers have to be specially trained. You, ju you, just, can't, you just can't create a functional illiterate accidentally. It requires extreme planning to do so. And American schools now, now produce more functional illiterates than any nation in the world, so we're number one in that respect. Iceland has a long ways to go before they catch up with us. Now, now to get back to the difference between an alphabetic and an, and an ideographic writing system. Ours is an alphabetic writing system. Now what does that mean? That means that we use an alphabet. Now what is an alphabet? An alphabet is a set of graphic symbols, we call them letters, that stand for the irreducible speech sounds of the language. Now, all alphabets are the same in that respect. The Russian alphabet stands for the sounds of the Russian language. The Hebrew alphabet stands for the sounds of the Hebrew language. Uh, the Greek alphabet stands for the sounds of the Greek language. Now, how do you teach a child to read an alphabetic writing system? Well, first you teach him to recognize the letters of the alphabet. And that's easily done. The ABC song, the alphabet song, uh, blocks. There are many techniques to do it, but children learn the alphabet letters quite easily, quite readily, if you bother to teach it to them. The second step is to teach the child the sounds that the letters stand for. Now, how do you do that? Uh, uh, do you, um, uh, there are many different ways, but probably the most common way that was used, the common method, most common method used for generations, for hundreds of years, was to teach a child, say for example, uh, an isolated consonant sound. The fact that, say that the letter B stands for the sound B, and then they would join the, the consonant with the vowel letters, and they would teach the child consonant vowel combinations in column form and they would drill the child in those consonant vowel combinations such as baby bi bi bo bu me me my mo mu ba ba bi ba ba ma me me ma ma and the child could learn them very easily now the purpose of that drill was to make sure that the child developed the proper association between letter and sound an automatic uh, association between letter and sound. That was the purpose of that drill. And once that association was, was achieved, was developed, then you went on to reading whole words. And then the child was given whole words to read. And of course the child could sound out most of what he was given because he knew what the letters stood for. And there was this immediate response, an immediate association between letters and sounds. Well now, Somewhere in the early 1930s, the, uh, the professors of education decided to... Uh, now, no, let me get back to that. Now, the, al before the alphabet was invented about 2,000 years B.C. Now, what were the forms of writing used before the alphabet was invented? Well, the earliest form of writing was known as pictography. Pictographs. Now, what are pictographs? Well, if you've seen pictures of the drawings that the cavemen drew on, on the walls of the caves, uh, you, you've seen them in National Geographic, they would be hunting scenes or uh, battle scenes. Uh, the symbols are easy to, uh, uh, the symbols are very easy to recognize. A man looks like a man. 
A tree looks like a tree, an animal looks like an animal, a um, bow and arrow looks like a bow and arrow. In other words, in pictography, in pictographs, the symbols look like the things they represent. In other words, you don't have to go to school to learn to read pictographs. Language is used to interpret pictographs. But as civilization became more complex, the scribes had to begin drawing pictures of things that did not lend themselves to depiction, particularly when you were dealing with ideas. For example, it's easy enough to draw a picture of a tree, but how do you draw a, a picture of, say, the concept of easy, or facilitate, or accept, or determine? How do you draw a picture of determine? You can't. So you draw a picture that doesn't look anything like determined, but you say, this stands for determined, you see. And the scribes drew thousands of such little pictures to stand for different ideas uh, and things that could not be de depicted. And now you have, and we call that system of writing ideographs. And now you did have to go to school to learn to read because somebody had to tell you what all of these different symbols stood for. Now, an early form of uh, ideographs was uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Uh, I'm sure that many of you have seen Egyptian hieroglyphics on, you know, mummy uh, tombs and that sort of thing. And of course, it's impossible to know what those symbols stand for unless somebody has told you what they stand for. In fact, Western uh, Westerners were unable to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics until the Rosetta Stone was discovered in Egypt by one of Napoleon's soldiers in 1799. Now, what was the Rosetta Stone? Well, the Rosetta Stone had Egyptian hieroglyphics on the top half of the stone and then a translation of what was uh, written in Greek alphabetic writing. So for the first time, Westerners, modern in, uh, scholars were able to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics. Now, modern Chinese is an ideographic writing system. The Chinese have about 50,000 of those little squigglies. I'm sure you've seen them. And they don't look like anything that they represent. For example, the, I'm sure you've seen them on Chinese menus. And the squiggly for uh, chicken chow mein does not look like chicken chow mein. And the Chinese symbol for egg roll does not look like an egg roll. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's very hard to tell what they represent. And, and so it's a difficult language uh, to, to learn to read. Now, you have to memorize at least 5,000 of those little uh, squigglies before you can read a Chinese newspaper. And uh, there's a Chinese translator at the UN who uses a Chinese typewriter. How many keys do you think a Chinese typewriter has? 1,000 keys. So that's not an easy system to use. But that's what, that's the, that was the, prevalent, uh, the prevailing form of writing until sometime around 2,000 years BC when somebody made a remarkable discovery. Somebody discovered that all of human language, everything we say, is composed of a small number of irreducible speech sounds. And that individual said, gee, instead of using this cumbersome system of thousands of little pictures that don't look like anything they represent. Why don't I create a set of symbols to stand for the irreducible speech sounds of the language, and then we will have a very easy means of transcribing the spoken language directly into written form, and an equally easy means of translating the, uh, the written language back into spoken form. And so the first alphabet was invented. Now, Something else happened very uh, uh, soon after the uh, invention of the alphabet. The scripture began to appear. You see, mankind had to wait until the alphabet was invented before the word of God could be put on paper. Why? Because how does God communicate with the human race? He does not send us little pictures. He does not send us comic books. He does not send us images. He speaks to us through the spoken word. Now, the English language has a vocabulary approaching a million words. How many irreducible speech sounds do you think there are in English? Now, I ask that question of every audience because I want them to realize how poorly educated they've been by their schools, because this is the kind of information that every youngster should have been given 
in kindergarten or the first grade at the latest. Now, I wasn't given that information. I went through life not even knowing that until I uh, was, uh, was researching this subject. And I found out, now does anyone want to volunteer how many, how many irreducible speech sounds there are in English? How many? That's right. You got it, 44 sounds. <laughs> now, you might ask, well, if we've got 44 sounds in English, how come we have a 26-letter alphabet? Good question. The reason why we have that is because, uh, incidentally, there are, alphabet, there are languages uh, that have one alphabet letter for each sound of the language. We don't. We should really have 44 letters, but we don't. We have 26. How come? Well, when the Romans conquered the British islands, they imposed the Latin alphabet on the people who lived there. And the people there adapted the Latin alphabet to their uses. Now, if you've got 44 sounds and only 26 letters, what do you do? Well, some of the letters have to do double duty. Some of the letters have to stand for more than one sound. And sometimes uh, you use more than one letter to stand for a sound, for one sound. For example, take our, our sound sh. We use sh, two letters, to stand for that sound. Or ch. We use a ch. Uh, take the letter A, for example. That letter at, at least stands for four sounds. The letter A stands for long A, as in apron or April. It stands for short A, that is the A, as in cat or at. It stands for the A ah sound, as in father. And it stands for the or sound, as in all or fall. So there you have one letter that must stand for four sounds. And this is how we've made do with a 26-letter alphabet. Now, it does present some problems when you're teaching it. When you're teaching our alphabetic system to youngsters, it does present some problems. But what it means is that you've got to teach your, uh, our alphabetic system in a systematic, logical way, starting with the easiest, the most regular, and then progressing to the uh, more difficult and, and irregular. That's the way it should be done if you're going to use your common sense, you see. And that's the way it was done for uh, many uh, centuries. That's how children were taught to read, and of course they all learned very well. There was no such thing as dyslexia in those days, because everybody can learn baby by bo bu. That's no big deal, you see. Everyone could learn that. And of course, if you read the books that were written in the 1700s and the 1800s, you'll realize that their vocabulary was far more extensive and difficult than ours. Their sentence structure was far more complex. I mean, pick up, a book, pick up uh, any of Edgar Allan Poe's books. Try reading that today and compare it to, uh, to uh, uh, Jerome Robbins or some of your modern writers. Or even read um, uh, Mark Twain. The vocabulary of Tom Sawyer is quite extraordinary. So everyone learned to read that way, and our system is not that, uh, that difficult to learn. As a matter of fact, our, with our English alphabetic system, we've created the world's greatest literature. The plays of Shakespeare, the works of, of Milton, John Locke, and of course, the greatest single uh, uh, book in existence, the King James Version of the Bible, let me see. So the English alphabetic system has served us very well. As a matter of fact, when the alphabet was invented, it swept away ideographs, the whole ideographic system, uh, oh, uh, you know, from use, and was immediately uh, spread throughout the Western world. Now you might ask, why would professors then in the 1930s be decide to, to discard what is probably the easiest and best way to teach reading, uh, the advantages of an alphabetic writing system and then teach children to read English as if it were an ideographic writing system, like Chinese. Why would they do such a thing? First of all, how can you teach anyone to re read English that way? Well, this is how they decided to do it. They said, uh, what we will do is we will first teach step one. We will teach the children the alphabet. Well, they had to do that because if they didn't teach the alphabet, parents would really get upset. So they at least taught the alphabet. Then they said, we will skip step two. 
We will not drill the child in the letter sounds. We will not permit the child to develop that instant association between letter and sound, that automatic association between letter and sound. We won't permit that to happen. We will go from step one directly to step three, to whole words. And we'll, we will teach children to read a sight vocabulary. By sight, we will teach them to read whole words and to memorize whole words. Now, how do children learn to read English by memorizing whole words? How do they memorize a sight vocabulary? Do you know how? Any way they can. There isn't a single professor of education in America who can tell you how a child learns a sight vocabulary. To this day, they still don't know how a child does it. But they said, well, we just can't give the children, you know, uh, a list of words to memorize. We've got to do something a little more than that. We've got to be a little more helpful. So first they teach configuration clues. They'll draw a little frame around the word. Take the word horse. They'll draw a little frame around horse and they'll say, see the horse? Can you see something galloping in that frame? And of course, if the child is going to look at, a, at that word as a little picture, he isn't necessarily going to go from left to right or from right to left. He will try to latch on to something in that word that will remind him of horse. We don't know what it'll be. Maybe it'll be the S. Maybe the E, maybe the O, maybe a combination of letters. We haven't the faintest idea. But that's what he's got to do in order to see the picture. And then they realize that that would not be enough. So they say, okay, we'll also provide picture clues. So when we introduce the word horse, we will have lots of pictures of horses all over the page. 85 pictures and four words. That'll really drum it into the child's mind that this is a horse. So you've got configuration clues, picture clues. Incidentally, when they teach the configuration clues, the child, the sequence of letters is of, is of no great importance to the child. I mean, why should it be important? I mean, he's trying to find something that will remind him of a horse. So the sequence of letters is of no great importance. And he wonders, why are you making such a fuss over the proper sequence? Why do I have to spell this word correctly as long as I get it? As long as I can guess it. But to a phonetic reader, a phonics reader, the sequence of the letters is very important because the sequence of the letters follows the sequence in which the sounds are uttered. And if you associate letters with sounds, then the sequence of the letters makes great sense to you. But to a sight reader, it doesn't. He doesn't know what the letters stand for. For him, they may be there just for decoration. In any case, then they realize that configuration clues and context clues were not enough, so they said, well, we'll have to teach context clues because we can't have a picture of a horse every time we mention the word horse. So we will give the youngsters sentences such as, the man put the saddle on the, and the child will have to think, well, can't be a car. You don't put a saddle on a car. You don't put it on a house. It could be donkey. It could be kangaroo. It could be camel, but it must be horse. And that way he'll guess that it is horse because the sentence says the man put the saddle on the. But as you and I know, you can write a sentence, the man put the saddle on the truck. He put the saddle on the ground. But you see, that won't provide a context clue. So you've got to provide sentences with context clues. The child won't be able to read a, 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 a sentence that says the man put the saddle on the ground. Because he'll think, well, saddles only go on horses. You see, you can't put it on the ground. Well, then they realized that that too wasn't enough, so they said, we will also teach the child phonetic clues. In other words, we will teach the child initial consonant sounds. For example, we will tell the child that if the word begins with H, it cannot possibly be bicycle, barbecue, or banana. It can be house, hotel, hemorrhoids, or horses. But it can't be uh, bicycles, tramways, ocean liners, or anything like that. It's got to be something that starts, but it starts with that sound. And so they teach phonetic clues as an aid to guessing, to redu reduce the ridiculousness of the guesses. That's generally the way they teach reading. Nowadays, of course, they've mixed it all up. Sometimes they start with the phonetic clues and then go into whole words, but that's basically the methodology they use. Now you might ask, 
How could professors of education in their right minds require children to read, learn to read English in this ridiculous, absolutely stupid way? What could possibly have compelled them, made them, concoct a teaching technique which is so obviously inferior? Because all you have to do is listen to look-say readers. I've, I've trained many of these look-say readers. Incidentally, the leading, the top professor of, of reading in America, Dr. Kenneth Goodman, has called reading a psycholinguistic guessing game. That's what he's called it. And he told a reporter from the New York Times that if a child sees the word, the word horse and says pony, that's correct. In other words, well, the child is seeing something galloping, you know. If the child sees the word father and says dad, that's correct. If he sees the word mother and says mom, that's correct, because the child is seeing the picture. You see, in ideographs, the ideograph represents a concept, an idea. It does not represent the spoken language. Alphabetic writing is a direct transcription of the spoken word. Let me give you an example, a modern example. Today, you've often seen the modern ideograph, the circle with the cigarette in it and the slash through it. That's an ideograph. Now, when you look at that, what do you say? Oh, I can't smoke here. I can't light up here. No smoking allowed. No smoking permitted. I may not smoke. Uh, Défense de fumer. Nicht rauchen. Uh, no fumar. In other words, language is used to interpret the symbol. But when you see the sign, no smoking, N-O-S-M-O-K-I-N-G, that's all it says. That does not say smoking not permitted. It says no smoking because those letters represent those particular sounds. So you see the difference? Now, I've retrained many, um, uh, or trained many look-say readers to become phonetic readers. And before I can do that, first I want to find out how they read. And this is the way a, a, look -say, a typical look-say reader will read. Some of them read quickly. But they will, for example, as they're reading along, they will leave out words that are there. Uh, they're, you know, you're, they read aloud to you. Uh, they leave out words that are there. Then they put in words that aren't there. Then they will misread words such as, if the word says newspaper, they will say paper sometimes. Or if the word says telephone, they will say phone. They will read phone even though it says telephone, not phone. So they're very inaccurate readers. Then when they come to a word they've never seen before, they're, you know, stop. And they have terrible difficulty trying to, to uh, decode multisyllabic words, that they've never, particularly those that they've never heard before. And so you realize that they are very inaccurate readers, and the, and the problem is that they don't know that they are making these errors. And that's why their comprehension is so poor, because they're reading along, and then they say, this doesn't make sense. Well, of course it doesn't, because you and I know that you can change one letter in a sentence, and that's going to change the whole meaning of the entire sentence. But they don't see those details. They often leave off plurals. They don't see the S's at the end of words very often. Now, so here we are creating a nation of inaccurate readers, creating functional illiteracy, functional illiterates by the millions. And you ask yourself, why would professors of education put such a method in the schools? Well, when I first started looking into this, I thought it had something to do with stupidity. I thought the professors were stupid. You know, Rudolf Flesch thought they were stupid. So I thought they were stupid. But then when I looked into it a little more deeply, I realized that these were not stupid men. These were not only the nation's top educators, but they were the world's top psychologists. These men had created the graduate schools of education. They had created the graduate schools of psychology. They were giving out PhDs to everyone else. So they were not stupid men. Well, then I thought there must be another motive. And uh, when I was writing my book on the, uh, the, the new illiterates, I thought I had found that motive. See, when I, I wrote my book, The New Illiterates, I did a very careful 
line-by-line, -line, page by page analysis of the Dick and Jane reading program. And uh, I found out something very interesting. I found out that if you want to teach a child to read by alphabetic phonics, you don't need very much. All you need is a little book to teach the child the, alpha, the sounds of the letters. And then once you did that, you can give the child anything to read. I mean, you can use any text. As a matter of fact, teaching you didn't even need a textbook to teach a child the, the alphabet sounds. If you knew the sounds yourself, you could use a blank notebook. Or you could use a chalkboard. Uh, and so teach, the teaching of reading was a very inexpensive business. Very cheap. But to teach a child to read by the look same method, you needed a whole set of books. You see, because when you teach a child by this look same method, you start teaching the sight vocabulary. And the sight vocabulary of the first book must be included in the second book. And the sight vocabularies of the first and second books must be included in the third book. And so on. Otherwise, the child can't read because he's stuck. He's, He's stuck on the words that he has been taught. And so in order to teach uh, children to read now through Look Say, you need a whole set of books for every single child. And these are expensive books because they must be lavishly illustrated. You've got to have lots of picture clues. So now instead of being the cheapest thing in public school, the teaching of reading, it becomes the most expensive thing. Now the schools have to invest millions of dollars in basal reading programs. And you can imagine how delirious with joy this made the, profe the uh, not only the professors, but the publishers. Because now everybody was making so much money over the simplest, what was once considered the simplest and least expensive thing in the school. So I thought to myself, well, the, obviously the motive must be greed. It must be greed that they're making so much money off of these books. But then as I looked into this matter a little more, I began to realize that there was more to this than, than just greed. It could have been part of it, but not, it, couldn't have, it couldn't have been the motivation entirely because now all of these professors were dead and we're dealing with, with second, third, and fourth generation professors, teachers, superintendents, uh, principals, and you wonder, what's in it for them? I mean, they don't have the, the economic motivation that those professors had. So why do they persist in using this method, even though we know without a doubt, I mean, it's been documented so thoroughly that these methods cause uh, the symptoms of dyslexia, that they cause uh, reading disability. Why do they still use these books? Well, I decided in writing my NEA book that I would finally get down, uh, that I would finally get to the bottom of this. I wanted to find out what in blazes was in the minds of these men when they conceived this incredible, ridiculous way of teaching reading. Now I found out that the men who did all of this, the men who created all of this, were known as the progressives. Now who were the progressives? Well these were a new breed of educator that arose on the scene um, around, uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, now what was different about them? Well, the progressives were men who gave up belief in God, gave up belief in the Bible, gave up belief in religion. They discarded that. And now they put all of their faith in science, evolution, and uh, psychology. Science to them and the scientific method would provide the means to uh, gaining all the knowledge that human beings needed to, to have. Provided it was the key to knowledge of the universe. Evolution, of course, explained the origin of man. There was no such thing as the Garden of Eden, creation. All of that is just fairy tale and mythology. Man arose out of the same primordial ooze as all of the creatures and, and uh, species did. So that was explained away. And then, of course, psychology permitted us to understand human nature. It gave us a scientific means to finally understand what man was all about, human nature. And it also provided a scientific means of controlling human behavior. So you see they had a fantastic package there. That's all they needed, science, evolution, and psychology. That would teach us everything. 
Now these men also happened to be socialists. Now why were they socialists? I mean you don't have to, you can be an atheist and not be a socialist. But why were these men socialists? Well, because they had to deal with this problem of evil. And they rejected the biblical view of evil. And they had to deal with this problem. Now what is the biblical view, what is the biblical explanation for the, uh, the origin of evil? The Bible tells us that the reason why men do the horrible things they do is because of their sinful nature. That man fell in the Garden of Eden, that, uh, that, we, that Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they fell under the influence of Satan in the form of the serpent, and that they have inherited, they took on the sinful nature which they have then passed on to every generation since them. So we've all inherited this sinful nature which incidentally John Calvin characterized as being innately depraved. Innate depravity was his characterization of human nature. And of course if John Calvin were living in the 20th century you'd see what he would not be surprised but by, by what he'd see on television. He'd say, well, you know, that's what happens when human beings reject God and reject the restraints, God's commandments and God's laws and give free and full expression to their depraved natures. The Bible uh, shows us, points out the origin of evil and the problem of evil, but it also provides a solution. With the coming of Christ, Christ came to free men from their sinful natures, to offer them a forgiveness of sin, salvation, and eternal life. So while the Bible presents the problem of evil, it also presents a solution. What it is telling us is this. Yes, you were born with this sinful nature, but you don't have to lead an unhappy life. You don't have to be miserable. You can indeed lead a happy life, provided that you obey God's laws and live within his commandments. Now the progressives of course rejected all of that. They said that's fairy tale, there was no such thing as a garden of Eden, there's no such thing as sin, that's a figment of, of man's imagination. But then they had to come up with an answer, why do people do the horrible things they do? Well they decided that the origin of evil has nothing to do with an innate evil character in man, that, that as a matter of fact it's caused by conditions outside of man. That the cause of evil is ignorance, poverty, and social injustice. And then they ask themselves, what causes social injustice? Well, it's this horrible economic system we have called capitalism. That's what causes economic injustice. And it's this individualism that makes people selfish and self-centered. That causes uh, uh, social injustice. And of course it's religion which tells people that, they're, that they've got this sinful nature. And they said, well if you keep telling people that they're sinful by nature, of course they're going to be sinful. They're going to act sinful. He said, tell people that they're, that they're wonderful, that they're basically good, that they're basically perfectible. And then they'll act good and perfectible you see. Now, let's test the progressive's theory that the cause of evil is, um, or evil behavior is ignorance, poverty, and social injustice. Let's, let's take an example of one of the most depraved individuals in the 20th century, Dr. Joseph Mengele, the doctor who performed all those horrible experiments at Auschwitz concentration camp and who condemned millions of innocent human beings to their deaths and who was hunted, as you know, for, for years and as a war criminal. And uh, Well, was he ignorant? No, he went to the best German universities. He became a medical doctor. Was he a victim of poverty? No, he came from a wealthy industrial family. His family were manufacturers of farm implements in Bavaria. Uh, well, was he the victim of social injustice? No, he was a member of the elite in Germany. He never suffered a day of discrimination. He was on top. So this, the progressive theory just doesn't hold when it comes to, to uh, Joseph Mengele. But the biblical theory holds very well. It says if you discard God, if you throw off the restraints of the Bible, 
of God's laws, then you are capable of any and every possible depravity you can think of. And of course, if you also have a government that gives you the freedom to act that way, that helps, doesn't it? In any case, these men decided, as I said, that, that uh, evil was caused by social injustice and that the capitalist system was, was the cause of it all, and therefore they decided that we've got, we've got to get rid of capitalism, individualism, and religion and replace them with socialism, collectivism, and atheism or humanism. Now, these men realized, and incidentally, these men embarked on a messianic mission to change America. Why? Well, listen, when you reject God and you espouse this new point of view, you want to prove that you're right. Because it's very serious to reject God. And many of these men came out of good Christian homes. John Dewey taught Sunday school in Vermont when he was a youngster. Um, Thorndike, I think his, his parents were missionaries. Some of these people had parents who were, were, uh, were, were ministers. So when you, re when you reject the religion of your ancestors, the religion of your parents, of your heritage, you're very anxious to prove that you're right. And so they embarked on a, mission, on, a, on a messianic mission to change this country according to what they believed was right. Well, now they realized that American adults were not about to give up their private property, their religions, and their individualism. So they said, if we want to change America, we're going to have to work on the children. We'll have to educate the children in such a way that they will bring about the necessary changes. They will reject capitalism. They will reject individualism. They will reject religion. Now, in order to do so, they had to create a new curriculum for the schools. And so John Dewey got to work in his laboratory school at the University of Chicago. And he spent two years working on creating a new curriculum that would do what they wanted done. At the end of that period, he put all of his findings, his proposals, into a little book entitled School and Society. It's a very short book. You can read it in a single sitting. Now, what did John Dewey propose? He said what we have to do is downgrade the literacy, the academic, the intellectual skills, skills that we, today we call the cognitive domain. We've got to downgrade all of that. And then we've got to put the emphasis on the development of social skills, behavior, emotions, uh, social studies, values. That's what we've got to work on if we're going to change the children to be what we want them to be. Now you might ask, why did Dewey feel that they had a downgrade literacy? Well, because he and his colleagues believed that high literacy was an, a serious obstacle to socialism. Why? Because high literacy produced uh, these in, uh, this people with this, uh, this in independent intelligence, individuals with this independent intelligence who could stand on their own two feet and think for themselves. They didn't have to rely on anyone else. But you see, in a socialist society, you have an elite at the top that does the thinking for everybody else. You can't have lots of individualists on the bottom who are going to constantly contradict you. You see? And besides, uh, these independent individuals, they can, they can curl up in a corner and read a book, and they couldn't care less about the collective. They couldn't care less about working with in the group. The group dynamic doesn't work with them. Because they're individuals, they're independent individuals who can stand on their own two feet. So they said, we've got to get rid of that kind of person in America. And so what we've got to do is lower the literacy level of the American people, dumb them down. Now, they had a problem on their hand. How were they going to give the impression to the American people that they were educating their children while at the same time dumbing them down? It's quite a job, quite a problem. Well, remember, these men were the world's top psychologists. They put their heads together and they found a, a tremendous solution. They said, well, all we have to do is teach children to read English as if it were Chinese. That'll do the trick. And that's exactly what they did. They took a method that had been uh, invented by Tom, the Reverend Thomas H. Gallaudet in the mid-1800s, around 1830s, 
a look same method. You see, Tom, uh, the Reverend Gallaudet was the director of the school for the deaf and dumb in Hartford, Connecticut. And he taught the deaf to read by showing them a picture and a word next to the picture, because the deaf could not hear the sounds of the language. So they had to learn by a purely sight technique. And that's the way, he, and he thought that he could adapt this method for normal children. So he wrote the first look say prima ever written, ever uh, published in the United States, and proved to be such a disaster that it was thrown out of the schools and forgotten, and the public schools of Boston went back to uh, uh, phonics, teaching, reading the way it had always been taught. Well, the professors dusted off this, this old method, and then they applied their new methodology to this. Their, the, uh, the findings that they had made in their laboratories. You see, all of these men believed in evolution, and they believed that children were animals, that they were little animals, and that you could teach them as little animals. And therefore, they did all of their experiments with animals. For example, Edward L. Thorndike, who was the father of educational psychology in America, he did all of his experiments with chickens. He thought that you could learn a lot about how children learn by studying chickens. And in fact, he developed uh, the uh, stimulus response technique of teaching, which became the dominant uh, teaching methodology in American schools, stimulus response. Um, Pavlov in Russia, Ivan Pavlov in Russia, did his experiments with dogs. I'm sure you're familiar with the Pavlov dog. Pavlov developed the most sophisticated techniques of conditioning uh, dogs, which were then applied to the teaching of children. Pavlov not only developed methods of conditioning uh, uh, dogs, but he also developed highly sophistic sophisticated methods of artificially inducing behavioral disorganization. In other words, he could do that in the laboratory. And so they knew the principles of how to disorganize behavior. That's what Pavlov was working on. Then, of course, John B. Watson in the United States, uh, around 1912 or so, uh, did his, ex he was the father of behaviorism. He did his experiments with rats. And uh, B.F. Skinner, who followed in his footsteps, of course, did his most important experiments with rats also. You see, B.F. Skinner believes that there isn't much of a difference between a rat and a human being. Now, there may not be much of a difference between B.F. Skinner and a rat, <laughs> but I believe that there is considerable difference between human beings and rats. In any case, they decided they applied these new techniques, conditioning techniques, uh, animal training techniques, uh, to this look-say method, and by 1930, the books were ready for the schools. The Dick and Jane readers, uh, edited by William Scott Gray at the University of Chicago, they were ready, and the Macmillan readers, uh, edited by Arthur I. Gates, were ready. Incidentally, Arthur I. Gates, who created the Macmillan readers, the new ones, the Look Say readers, had never taught a single child a single day in his life, and neither did uh, Edward L. Thorndike. As a matter of fact, I found, I, I found this out very interestingly. I was reading a short autobiographical um, essay by Gates, and he describes how he was hired when, when um, Thorndike, Professor Thorndike, asked Gates to become his assistant in, in working on these problems. Gates said to him, uh, but uh, Dr. Thorndike, I've never taught a child a single day in my life. And Dr. Thorndike answered, neither have I. And those are the men who change the way reading is taught in American schools, you see, um, by using animal training techniques. In any case, the books were ready for the schools in 1930. Well, did anyone know what was about to, to happen? Did anyone know what, was that, what these professors were about to do? Well, the parents certainly didn't know, but one man knew. Who was he? He was Dr. Samuel T. Orton, a neuropathologist at, the, uh, at Iowa State University. Now, Dr. Orton was dealing with children's problems at the time, and apparently in Iowa they had been using this new method of teaching on an experimental basis. And he was seeing a lot of children with reading problems. And in diagnosing them, he came to the conclusion that their problems were caused by this new teaching technique. 
And so knowing that the professors were about to put these new books in the schools, he became very alarmed and decided to write an article to alert everyone to this danger. And so he published an article, or he wrote an article that was published in the February 1929 issue of the Journal of Educational Psychology. The title of the article was, The Sight Reading Method of Teaching Reading as a Source of Reading Disability. And this is what he wrote. Uh, now, you must remember that he was approaching this subject, you know, very diplomatically. You know, he, tread, he was treading on very sensitive toes. He was about to criticize the work of the world's leading psychologists, of these paragons in the American education establishment, these demigods. And so he had to be very circumspect, but he made himself very clear. This is what he said. He said, I wish to emphasize at the beginning that the strictures which I have to offer here do not apply to the use of the sight method of teaching reading as a whole, but only to its effects on a restricted group of children for whom, as I think we can show, this technique is not only not adapted, but often proves an actual obstacle to reading progress. And moreover, I believe that this group is one of considerable size. And because here faulty teaching methods may not only prevent the acquisition of academic education by children of average capacity, but may also give rise to far-reaching damage to their emotional life. Well, there he said it all, quite plainly. He said, first of all, that this new teaching technique would be an obstacle, would prove to be an obstacle to reading progress, and that the group affected was one of considerable size. Today we know that size is one-third of the total student population. It's a lot of students. How do we know that? Through various ways, but one of the, uh, probably the easiest way is the number of dropouts we have. The NEA tells us that we have one-third of the students drop out, you see. Why do they drop out? Well, they can't read, so why should they stay in school any longer? You see. And I've had it confirmed and through other means as well. I can't go into them because that would take so much more time. So you have a considerable group that's, that's being influenced. One third of the student population is being affected. And then he refers to faulty teaching methods. I call that educational malpractice. And then he says that these methods will not only prevent the acquisition of an academic education by children of average capacity, not special children, not spe children with any special problems, but average children, but that it will have a terribly damaging effect on their emotional life. And if any of you saw these poor functional literates on television, you could see what, what they've suffered emotionally throughout their lives. Now you might ask, well, maybe the professors didn't read this, this particular article. Well, they had to read it because it was published in their own journal. The Journal of Educational Psychology was their journal. As a matter of fact, Dr. Gates was one of the editors of the journal. So he had to read it. Well, why did they publish it if they disagreed with Dr. Orton? Well, I believe that in their own cynical way they published it because they wanted confirmation that what they were about to do would indeed cause the problems that they wanted to cause. And what better way to do it than to publish an article by a very distinguished doctor uh, and to just uh, discard what he had to say. You see, they couldn't go around the country telling their colleagues hey, we're about to put in the schools a method that's going to destroy literacy. It's going to dumb down the people. They let Dr. Orton do it for them. Incidentally, Dr. Orton was not just any old doctor. He went on to become the world's leading authority on dyslexia. He and Anna Gillingham developed the most, the, probably the, the most effective remedial uh, reading techniques to take care of the youngsters who were subsequently damaged by this reading program. Well, no, so and uh, no sooner were the books put in the schools than America began to have a reading problem. As a matter of fact, by 1944, dyslexia had become a household word. Life magazine in April of 1944 uh, published a, a lead article on dyslexia, and this is what they said. Millions of children in the United States suffer from dyslexia, which is a medical term for reading difficulties. You see, that was 1944, before television, before the Vietnam War, before nuclear fallout. 1944, 
you see. And um, the editors of Life asked the professors, what is causing all this dyslexia? And the professors answered, uh, uh, glandular imbalance, heart disease, eye or ear trouble, or from a deep-seated psychological disturbance that blocks a child's ability to learn. You see, they knew that something was blocking the children's ability to learn, but they didn't know what, so now they attribute it to a deep-seated psychological disturbance. The article then described the cure given a young girl afflicted with dyslexia. Thyroid treatments, removal of tonsils and adenoids, exercises to strengthen her eye muscles. Nowhere did they recommend teaching her the alphabet, which would have been the simple thing to do. But you would have thought that the editors of Life would have been smart enough to ask the professors, gee guys, if, if, if the reading problem is being caused by heart disease, why are you taking out her tonsils? But they didn't ask such questions. So you can imagine the professors laughing all the way to the bank. Here they were, causing millions of children untold misery, crippling them academically, and becoming millionaires in the process. Oh, but they were doing it for a great cause, to change America, you see. Uh, the end justifies the means. Well, this is the way it was until 1955 when someone finally blew the whistle on these characters. Who was it? Dr. Flesh. In his famous book, Why Johnny Can't Read. He told the American people, look, there's nothing wrong with your children. It's this stupid, uh, asinine method of teaching reading. And then he pointed a, a, an accusing finger at the, at the professors and he said, look, you dummies. Don't you know that phonics works better than look say? But of course they knew that. He wasn't telling them anything they didn't know. And they were absolutely furious with him, enraged by him. Why? Because he had held them up to public ridicule. He had made them appear stupid in public. And they were anything but stupid. They were the world's top psychologists. They were sitting on the top of the entire American education system. And so they said, we'll fix this man's wagon. And so they proceeded to turn the entire teaching profession against Rudolf Flesch. They vilified him. They told the teachers, don't read him. He doesn't know what he's talking about him. He's evil. He wants to destroy American education. He's the devil incarnate. As a matter of fact, when Time Magazine summed up that year of teacher opposition to Rudolf Flesch, the title of the article was The Devil in the Flesh. So it just shows you how, how, uh, how effective those professors were in turning the teaching profession against uh, Rudolf Flesch, who was finally trying to tell them, look, people, you're doing it all wrong. And then they did something equally clever. They created the International Reading Association, which has become the nation's largest, most influential uh, organization, professional association for uh, elementary school teachers in this country. And it is that organization that to this day tells teachers how to teach reading. If you attend their conferences or their convention, you will find all of the basal readers displayed there. And they never invite a proponent of intensive phonics to speak at their, speak at their conventions. You will never find a single workshop devoted to intensive phonics there because they keep them out. They know. They know what they're doing. And to prove to you that the methods that they use are based on animal training, let me read to you a description of the look say method given by Professor Walter Dearborn, top educational psychologist at Harvard University. This is what he wrote in 1940. He said, the principle which we have used to explain the acquisition of a sight vocabulary is, of course, the one suggested by Pavlov's well-known experiments on the conditioned response. This is as it should be. The basic process involved in conditioning and in learning to read is the same. In other words, he's telling us that we teach children to read as if they were dogs. Now, I submit that there is a bit of a difference between a child, a little child, and a dog. 
You see, when a dog enters the first grade, what can the dog say? <laughs> arf, arf, right? And let us assume that that canine, our canine friend is then socially promoted right through to the 12th grade, reaches that momentous occasion at graduation, approaches the podium, holds out his paw to receive his diploma, looks up into the eyes of the principal, and what can he say? Arf, arf. In 12 years, he hasn't learned a single word. But a human child enters the first grade with a speaking vocabulary of between 5,000 and 35,000 words. Isn't that an amazing achievement? This little child starts teaching himself to speak his own language from virtually birth. And by the time he's ready to enter the first grade, he has developed his verbal and auditory skills to such a high level that he's got a speaking vocabulary in the thousands of words. And this child has done it all by himself. Every child teaches himself to speak his own language all by himself, without the help of Sesame Street, without the help of frosted flakes and puppets jumping out of garbage cans. And these children do it, you know, all their waking hours. They don't stop at 3 o'clock, do they? And you don't have to bribe them to learn to speak their own language, do you? They do it all by themselves, quite willingly. You see, every little human child is a very serious learner. And they're no-nonsense learners. They don't need all that garbage to learn how to speak, do they? But yet we pile the garbage on the minute they enter school. The minute they enter school, we bury them in garbage. That's what we do. So here are these youngsters who feel very intelligent. That's why youngsters, five-year-olds, feel so intelligent. They are. Any youngster who can teach himself to speak his own language is intelligent. And why? Because God made him that way. God gave human beings the ability to speak. And he gave human beings this tremendous language learning energy in those first four years. So that's something that every human being can do and has the capacity to do. Why? Well, because God wanted to communicate with us. He gave us language because we were made in his image and he wanted to communicate with us and so he gave man the ability to speak. No other species has it. You know, the behavioral psychologists, uh, psychologists are very upset by this. <laughs> They don't like the notion that human beings are the only species that speaks. As a matter of fact, they've tended to downgrade human language. They call it verbal behavior. And they say that, well, human speech is really just an evolutionary development from animal speech. You know, it's just, just a more complex form of the chirp or the bow, bow wow or the, or the meow or the growl. And they, as a matter of fact, they believe that the reason why monkeys don't speak is because they've been culturally deprived. <laughs> and so they've actually had experimented by having little monkeys live in, um, among human families to see if they would learn to speak. And so the monkeys would eat their cornflakes with everyone else at breakfast, but somehow they never learned to speak. They were just like our canine friend in school who, who ended school saying as much as when he entered, arf, arf. I don't know how you can even imitate a monkey sound. Which, I don't know, how do monkeys sound? But in any case, the monkeys didn't learn to speak. Only human beings speak. Well, now our Johnny, who has taught himself to speak his own language, is now ready to go to school. And so he enters school feeling very, very intelligent, ready to learn, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. After all, if, if he can teach himself to speak his own language, he certainly can learn to read. So he enters the first grade and his teacher is using the Dick and Jane Basil series and this is what he's given to read by sight. Dick, look Jane, look, look, see Dick, see, see, oh see, see Dick, oh see Dick, oh, 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 funny, funny Dick. And this little chap sits there and he says to himself, gee, either I'm crazy or she's crazy. I mean, this is not the way people talk. Boy, I mean, and he ought to know, he, he rattles off at the dinner table every night, so here's, what's all this look, look, O, O, C, C? So he says to himself, gee, this school is a weird place. But mother has told me to behave myself, listen to the teacher, and I will do the best I can. 
But let us assume that our Johnny is one of the one-third identified by Dr. Orton who would have problems learning to read. Why? Well, maybe he's got great verbal and auditory skills, but his visual skills are not so hot. I mean, he doesn't have a photographic memory, so he's going to have problems. And so by the end of the year, he indeed is having problems. And he's doing so poorly that mother is called to school and told Mrs. Jones, Johnny has a reading problem. Johnny will have to stay back a year. And so here is Johnny who felt so intelligent in September. Now in June, he's beginning to think, gee, maybe I'm dumb. And then uh, at the end of that year, he isn't doing any better uh, either. As a matter of fact, he's doing worse. And mother is called to school again and told Mrs. Jones, Johnny has a learning disability. Johnny is dyslexic. We shall have to put him in special education. And by now, mother is frantic. She's thinking, have I given birth to a defective child? Does my child have a birth defect, a learning problem? And, and he's taken to the doctors to be tested and to be evaluated and examined. And everybody's wondering, what's wrong with Johnny? What's wrong with Johnny? And Johnny is saying to himself, I can't learn. I'm dumb. I can't learn. I've got dyslexia. I'm dumb. And, the, you know, the doctors are trying to find a reason. I think, well, maybe it's an allergy. Maybe it's uh, he eats too many Twinkies. Uh, who knows? You know, they don't know what's wrong with Johnny, but they want to know what's wrong with Johnny, not what's wrong with the school. What's wrong with the methods being used in the school? It's all Johnny's fault. There's something wrong with Johnny. And so Johnny goes through another year of this, and at the end of that year, things are even worse because now Johnny has become a behavioral problem. He's now swinging from the rafters. And so mother is called to school again and told, Mrs. Jones, Johnny may have minimal brain damage. And if Johnny is to remain in school, Mrs. Jones, he will have to take medication. And so off to the doctors he goes, and of course they recommend their favorite behavioral modification drug known as Ritalin. And in a very short time, Johnny uh, has become a little zombie in the classroom, destined for a life as a functional illiterate. Now this scenario is going on all over America, virtually in every school district, where we have these thousands and thousands of little Johnnies going through this whole horrible uh, process. And the criminal part of it is that it's totally unnecessary. You see, we know how to teach reading. We're not looking for a cure for cancer. We know how to do it. Totally needless. I mean, Marva Collins teaches kids to read in her school in Chicago. You remember Marva Collins, the black educator in Chicago who spent 14 years in the public schools of Chicago, became so disgusted and frustrated that she went out and created a private school of her own in her own home, took little black children who were considered uneducable, and she's turned them into literate human beings with a future. How did she do it? By teaching them how to read in the correct manner, plus some other techniques which she uses, but primarily at least teaching them how to read in the correct way. And I've visited her school, I've been there, and I can, I can tell you it's a very unpretentious place in the middle of the Chicago ghetto. It looks like an abandoned supermarket with the, with the windows all graded up. But when you get inside there, you find an, a West Point of the mind. She is training kids like you wouldn't believe. And all of these kids are learning very well. They can all learn very well. You know, in 1930, the illiteracy rate among urban blacks was 9.2%. Today, it's 50%. Well, have the blacks lost the ability to learn to read? No. They have just been totally destroyed by this, these teaching methods that, as I said, were deliberately created to produce reading dysfunction, reading disability, functional illiteracy. So we know how to do it. And to give you an idea of how many youngsters are affected by this, back in the, in the late 60s, the Congress of the United States passed a law requiring all public schools to provide equal educational opportunity for the handicapped. Now, when they were thinking of the handicapped, they were thinking of the deaf, the dumb, the blind, the crippled. But you know what is now the single largest group of youngsters in your handicapped special education program, the learning disabled. 
1977, there were 796,000 youngsters labeled learning disabled in the programs. In 1984, there were 1,804,000. So it shows you this, there's a graph going straight up. Now all the other conditions have been rather stable. We're not getting any more blind kids or deaf kids or crippled kids, but the learning disabled are going through the roof. As a matter of fact, it has become the growth industry in education today, dealing with the learning disabled. And the schools have now become very proficient in producing learning disabilities. So now they have a whole profession to deal with the learning disabilities they create. And if you want to know how many kids in Kansas are in learning disabled programs, let's see how well you are doing. In 1985, the total number of children of all conditions in your learning disabled uh, program, uh, in your handicap special education program, was approximately 40,000. Of those, the learning disabled were 16,443. So 16 out of approximately 40, you see. That's a lot of learning disability that you're creating in the state of Kansas. Well, are they improving anything? You know, the, the, uh, that National Commission on Excellence in Education was so alarmed by this decline in literacy that they, sound, that they wrote that important report, they issued that report, A Nation at Risk. And everybody was supposed to then get involved in, in improving educational excellence. Well, let me give you an idea of how much improvement has been made. The new, uh, the uh, 1986 SAT scores are in. South Dakota went down 11 points. North Dakota went down 17 points. Illinois went down 5 points. Kansas went down 12 points. There you are. I mean, where's this educational excellence that we're supposed to be getting from all of this acknowledgement of our literacy problem? Now, the other day when I was in Grand Island, I was told by the reporter of the newspaper who was interviewing me, oh, we've got a new reading program in our schools, uh, and it has lots of phonics in it. I said, well, who is the publisher? He said, Houghton Mifflin. I said, Houghton Mifflin, that's one of the worst. He said, we've got the new edition. He says, have you seen the new edition? I said, no, my information is based on the, old, you know, the previous edition. So I decided that I would tr try and, and see the new edition, get hold of it. And the, the friend of mine who was showing me around Grand Island knew the principal in the elementary school. So we went over there, and I asked the principal if I could see the, uh, the new uh, um, Houghton Mifflin books. And he was very cooperative, very nice guy. He thinks he's doing the best for his kids. He's got them all brand new reading books. But I knew that the house of Houghton Mifflin had a reputation for being among us, among those of us who know, as being one of the worst of the look say reading, basal reading systems. So I went through the book, and lo and behold, it was worse than I could have dreamed. Absolutely worse than I could have dreamed. As a matter of fact, when we finally got to the first little story, the first little story in which they showed, the picture showed a boy and a girl uh, in a, uh, and a dog. It's either in a boat or a sled, something like that. But this, this was the dialogue. These were the words that the children were learning. And I will read you verbatim. I copied them down. I, I couldn't believe. It. This is what they, if you thought that look, look was bad, listen to this. Go, go, go. I, I go, I go, go, go. Go, I go, go, I go, 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 I go, I go, I go, 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 I go. That's it. Now, is this calculated to drive the kids crazy or what? I mean, you know, is this great literature? Is this going to make the kids want to learn to read? I won't burden you with the, the other stories that followed, which are just as ridiculous, just as bad. And, and I thought to myself, don't these people read anything? I mean, the critics have been working on this for years. The Reading Reform Foundation, Rudolf Flesch, myself, other writers. I mean, we're not the only ones. What are we, crying in the wind? Are we just, don't the educators care? Don't they read? 
Apparently not. Apparently not, they don't. But now they know that in Grand Island they're going to have a reading problem, you know. And, and I just, my heart goes out to these poor little kids who are entering that first grade and who are going to have their brains fried in six months. Now you must remember that these techniques were devised by the world's top psychologists. They know how the mind works. They've been playing around with the brain for 80 years. They know what this is doing to the kids. If they don't, they're totally and utterly incompetent. And this is what's going on. Now, I don't know what you're using here in, in Topeka, but I understand the Houghton Mifflin is being used. As a matter of fact, they just got the new edition, the Go-Go edition. <laughs> You've got the Go-Go edition is now here, and if you don't go to the State House or your Board of Education or something, just and raised and say, how dare you, after all that has been written and said about functional literacy, to put this, this garbage in the schools, how dare you do that? But that's what's happening. But the children are not only at risk academically, they're at risk in other ways also. They're at risk spiritually, they're at risk morally, and they're at risk physically. Now, how are, how are they at risk uh, spiritually? Well, the schools are doing everything in their power to undermine the religious faith of the children. How? through values, clarification, sensitivity training, situational ethics, multiculturalism, globalism, yoga, transcendental meditation, uh, sex education, evolution, death education. Have you heard of death education? How many people have heard of death education? All right, so it's not foreign to you. Death education was introduced to the schools around the mid-70s. And ever since then, we've had this climbing rate of teenage suicide. One mother told me that her daughter actually watched the mortician embalm a corpse. The kids write their own obituaries. What a cheerful thing to do. The kids also plan their own funerals. A mother told me that her, no, not a mother, a woman came up to me and told me that she had been required to, to uh, the assignment was to choose the music for your own funeral. How do you like that? And then they talk about suicide at great length. They write suicide notes. They, uh, they discuss suicide at length. When to commit suicide. Why? How to do it. Oh, they discuss the various techniques at great length. Now you, and there you have all these teenage suicides occurring. And if you ask the professor, you ask the teachers, you go into any school where they've had suicides and ask, what is causing these suicides? They will just shake their hands and wring, uh, shake their heads and wring their hands and say, we just don't know. We haven't the foggiest. We just don't know. Well, I believe that, that the suicides are being caused by a very lethal combination of lessons being given. You see, when you teach values clarification and death education, you're teaching the kids to hate life and love death. And when you put those two lethal things together, you get, in some children, suicide. Now, how do they teach the kids to hate life? Well, first of all, they give them such problems as, who are you going to throw out of the lifeboat, your grandmother or your sister? And here's a little 12-year-old or 13-year-old who has to decide who among his loved ones to kill. Well, you know, there are a lot of very sensitive kids who love their, their parents and their grandparents and their sisters so much that they would rather kill themselves than have to kill a loved one. But they're told also that this is real life. These are the kinds of decisions that you will have to make in life. And they assume that their parents know this too. They assume that their parents were taught this in school. And that's, that's some kind of a secret that's kept from them in the background. One of these days, he will have to choose who among his loved ones to kill. That's pretty depressing. And then you also tell the child, well, you know, you're an animal, you're a product of evolution, and there is really no meaning to life, and that all you have to look forward to is a nuclear holocaust. Boy, that will really make you feel good. And then they say, don't despair. Death can be beautiful. And then they take them to the funeral parlors and they discuss death. And I even read that particular line in one of the syllabuses on death education. It said, death can be beautiful at 20 years of age. 
And they talk about reincarnation and how it can solve a lot of problems for kids and for people and that it's a viable alternative. Suicide. And so all of a sudden we have all of these suicides and people wonder why we have those suicides because values clarification plus death education leads to suicide. And you know the kids who are committing suicide are the good kids, the nice kids, the loving kids. They come from good homes, they're loved. Nobody knows why they committed suicide. They have no reason. But their reason is very obvious. They're committing suicide because they want to show their parents how much they love them. They're saying, see, I'm not going to have to kill you. I prefer to kill myself than to kill you. So in a sense, they're showing their parents how much they love them. And in many of these suicide notes, they show great love. You know. Now, there were two, uh, when I was in um, Des Moines recently, I was told of, of four suicides that had occurred in a school in Carlisle, a suburb there, and I went there to investigate. And it turned out that all of these students came from the same, the class of 1986. And they were about, oh, sometimes a year or six months apart, or sometimes a couple of weeks apart. And the last two suicides, the two individuals, one, a, 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 a 17 year old who was the top of his class, top athlete, uh, wrote a, a note in which he meticulously planned his own funeral. He wanted his to be uh, laid out in his own football jersey and he wanted his shoes right there at the foot of the coffin and he wanted his girlfriend's picture right there in the coffin with him and he wanted to be uh, held, uh, laid in state in the gymnasium. The school didn't, didn't particularly like that part of it so they decided not to have the funeral in the gymnasium because they thought it might create problems. And then the girl who committed suicide, she wanted the football team to be her pallbearers. How do you like that? This thing gets weirder and weirder. Well, that's the kind of thing we're dealing with. You ask the, you ask the, and I went to that school and spoke to the principal and asked, what is causing these suicides? We just don't know. We haven't the foggiest. Well, in Boston, close to Boston, in Lemonster, we've had a high school that has had a dozen suicides in two years. So I decided I'm going to find out what is going on in that school. And I went there and I asked the principal, what is causing these suicides? We don't know. I said, are you teaching death education? Oh, of course. I'm teaching it for the last 12 years. And I asked, well, who, who teaches your death education? He said, our health education teacher. So I said, well, may I interview your health education teacher? He said, oh, sure, of course. And so I met the young, the man, he was in uh, early 40s or late 30s, and I asked him first, you know, what is causing the, your death, edu uh, what is causing your uh, suicide? We just don't know. I said, is it possible, is it remotely possible that death education may have an adverse effect on some youngsters? You know, maybe some youngsters are allergic to death education. <laughs> oh no, absolutely not. Completely sure, absolutely sure. Well, you and I know that nobody can be sure of such a thing. But he had to say he was sure. You know why? Because if he even admitted that a single youngster had committed suicide because of what they were teaching, they'd have to stop it, wouldn't they? And they don't intend to stop it. They don't intend to stop it at all. So then I asked him, I said, well, do you think things are going to get better or worse? So he asked, uh, well, what do you mean by better or worse? <laughs> I said, by better, I mean, you know, fewer suicides or maybe an end to the suicides. He, so his, his answer was, well, that's a matter of opinion whether that's better or worse. You know, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I thought, what is he saying? But then when I was driving back to Boston and was thinking in my mind, I thought to myself, yes, I understand what he's saying. He has been teaching youngsters that suicide is a viable alternative. And some of them are choosing suicide. So the lessons are working. If nobody committed suicide after all that death education, it would mean that the lessons aren't working, wouldn't it? And so to him, it's a sign that 
The message is getting through that suicide is a viable alternative and that you can do it, you're free to do it. It's no sin. Well, that's the kind of thing that's going on. So you put your child in a public school, if he doesn't become a functional illiterate, maybe he'll become a suicide. If not a suicide, then maybe an atheist or an agnostic or a cultist or a Satanist. Who knows? But that's what they're doing by undermining religion in the schools. Then, of course, the children are at risk morally because who do they meet in the public schools but the drug pushers, the drug users, the sexually active, the users of foul language. Drugs, you're all familiar with the drug problem. As a matter of fact, I found there was a big article in your local paper on the drug situation here in, uh, in Topeka. Marvin Bonjour, Chief of Security for Topeka Public Schools, has 17 years experience as a student watcher, including the drug-riddled early 1970s. Now, he says, now is the worst time ever for students using drugs. Now. That's what he says. And this whole article is about, it was a full-page thing that was published, uh, when, when was this? October 5th, this month, or last month. What's going on in your schools here? So you've got something to think about. And then, of course, I don't have to tell you about the unwanted pregnancies. I'm sure you have your quota. Incidentally, you know, the schools, you know how the schools are going to deal with this. They're going to set up sex clinics now in the high schools and they're going to give the kids pills and condoms free of charge. And that's going to cut down on the unwanted pregnancies. Of course, when you give ki kids pills and condoms, what are you telling them? Don't waste them. Use them. We're spending all this money on you, giving you free pills and condoms. Don't waste them. Use them. So you'll have more sexual activity. Of course, now they're beginning to become a little aware of this thing called AIDS. Everybody seems to have heard about it, and I guess the teachers have heard of it too, the sex education teachers, so they've decided that they're going to give the kids some education on AIDS. Of course, you know what AIDS, AIDS is probably the worst possible plague that has hit the human race since man's memory, since probably the bubonic plague is the only one we can think of. What is AIDS? It's caused by a virus called the lentivirus, a lentivirus. A lent the lentivirus was once known to exist only among animals. It has now jumped the species barrier and is now in the human race. The lentivirus was the kind of virus that required killing whole herds of cattle. For example, in Haiti, they've had to kill every single hog because of, of uh, infection with the lentivirus. Now, the peculiar thing about the lentivirus, the dangerous thing, is that it has a very long, symptomless incubation period. At first they thought this period was two years, then four years, then seven years. Now they think it may be as long as 14 years you can be walking around with a lenti, with this virus, this AIDS virus. Now, when you have it, you may have no symptoms, but you can give it to others. And it gets into all of your body secretions. All of your body, tears, saliva, everything. And so now we're dealing with something that is, that has really been sprung on us without our knowledge. You see, it's obvious that this lentivirus entered the human race somewhere, either in the late 60s or early 70s, because we didn't begin to see any, uh, individuals with obvious open symptoms until around 1979 when the first 11 cases were recorded in 1979 and these are people with full-blown AIDS. As a matter of fact the the uh, medical community believes that about between one and two million people in the United States have already been infected. Already infected. So the the 25,000 that are now have full-blown uh, symptoms are just the tip of the iceberg, just the tip of the iceberg, and this is fatal disease. Now, when they tell you, they tell you that the only way you can get AIDS is through uh, sexual um, activity, uh, needles, dirty needles, blood, tra you know, uh, contaminated blood, that sort of thing. They say, oh no, you cannot get it through casual contact. How can they say that? How do they know? 
I mean, if it takes as long as 14 years before you show symptoms, how are we going to know this? How can they be so sure? But they're willing to endanger every child in America on the basis of that, oh, no, you can't get it uh, uh, through casual contact. And so they're now saying that, any, that a teacher with AIDS can remain in the schools, a pupil with AIDS can stay in the school, and even cafeteria workers with AIDS can stay in school. This was at least done in, in New Hampshire. I don't know what your policy is here in your state, what your Department of Education has uh, handed down as policy. But in New Hampshire and other states, they have said that a teacher with AIDS can remain in the school. Now, when I was in Davenport, Davenport, Iowa, I was told by a talk show host that one of the teachers with AIDS in, the, in one of the schools there dropped dead in the classroom. And he told me there was another teacher with AIDS in that school who had contact with several hundred students every day. And they could not get him out because now it's a civil right, you see. AIDS is now considered a handicap. Not a disease, not an not a infectious, deadly disease, but a handicap. Therefore, you cannot get these people with AIDS out of jobs because then they can sue you. That One individual with AIDS sued the phone company in California and won. And the phone company had to pay this man over a million dollars. They had fired him because they wanted to protect their other employees. Now... In other words, the only way that you can get anyone with AIDS out of the schools is for them to be carried out on a stretcher. They can stay until that point where they simply cannot even stand on their legs or drop dead in the schools. Now, of course, this has terrible implications for the safety of the children in the schools because another thing they're, not, they're going to do is not tell you who has AIDS. They're going to guard the privacy of these people. So you'll have a teacher or a student or a cafeteria worker with AIDS, and you won't know who it is. You won't know who in the school has AIDS. So they, well, because you can't contact, you can't get it through casual contact. But if you're dealing with children who are sitting next to one another, what is going to happen when they share their food? You know, children share things. And what is it going to happen if they bite, if one child bites another? In West Germany, a three-year-and-a-half-year-old youngster with AIDS bit his five-year-old brother, and his five-year-old brother has gotten the disease now. It was a very casual, casual bite. <laughs> very casual bite. And in the United States, there was a similar incident not too long ago. As a matter of fact, I, I heard it over the radio about a, a, child who bit a, a child with AIDS who bit another child in the classroom. And... Um, I, uh, I didn't see anything about it in the newspapers until just the other day, uh, October 15th, when USA Today had an article on it. And this is what they said. The parents of four-year-old AIDS patient Ryan Thomas filed suit Tuesday to get him readmitted to kindergarten. Ryan, who got AIDS from a blood transfusion, was suspended from school after he bit a classmate September 8th six days after his parents won a 10-month battle to get him into classes. The lawsuit claims discrimination and violation of constitutional rights. The school is providing Ryan individual tutoring and offer to review his case before the next semester. Did you hear that? The youngster has AIDS, the parents go to court, spend 10 months getting him into school. He's there for six days. He bites another youngster. They suspend him. The parents are going back to, to the court to get him readmitted to the school. Isn't this crazy? Isn't this insane? What about the youngster who was bitten? What about his constitutional rights? Doesn't he have any? I mean, you can see how everything's been turned upside down. I mean, it's lunacy. We're doing everything in our power to protect the rights of the people with AIDS and nothing to protect those who want to be safeguarded. The healthy are being sacrificed. Because we don't want to hurt the feelings of the people with AIDS, obviously. Now, I don't want to cause any victim of AIDS any more suffering than is necessary, but why must we endanger the lives of children in the schools? And this is the kind of policy that is now uh, being handed down throughout America in many of the schools. You get a cafeteria worker who has pulmonary AIDS and sneezes on the jello, then what do you do? We've also heard of blood terrorism, AIDS terrorism. Some homosexuals who are so 
who feel that they've been so unjustly treated by, by fate that they would just as well take a few other people with them. Supposing this individual decides to spit in the soup every day. And we found out now that the AIDS virus can live at body temperature outside the body. Uh, no, can live at room temperature outside the body for about 15 days. And we're dealing with the most deadly disease that has come down the pike, a disease that may decimate the American people, may wipe, up one, wipe out one-third of the population. Well, now, the, the schools have decided they're going to teach the children all about AIDS. So, I don't know if you saw the Dan Rather show a, a week or two ago in which he interviewed some people with AIDS, and then they had an auditorium filled with students and they were going to educate them about AIDS. A nurse had been called in to teach the kids about AIDS. And one of the girls, a little girl in the audience, got up and she asked uh, the question. She, she asked, is there a vaccine for AIDS? And the nurse got up to the microphone and said, yes, there is a vaccine for AIDS and it's called rubbers. Rubbers. Rubbers? Well, if the AIDS virus is in all of, the all of the body secretions, where do you put the rubber? Over your head? <laughs> it's so ridiculous. You can see how stupid they are. Rubbers is going to cure AIDS. Go ahead, kids. Oh, we don't want to stop you. We know you're going to do it anyway. We know that you're stupid, dumb kids. You're going to do it anyway. So we'll give you rubbers. That's going to protect you, protect you from AIDS. Boy, situa you know, you wonder, what are we living in, Alice in Wonderland? Is this, have we lost all of our senses? You see, the people who have AIDS and those who love sexual freedom, what they want, they're, they're mad because President Reagan, the United States government, isn't spending billions and billions of dollars to find a vaccine so that they can continue enjoying their sexual freedom. That's their problem. That's why they say, you're not spending enough money to find a vaccine. We don't want to change our lifestyle for, for this silly disease. But you know the only way that this disease is going to be stopped in the United States? Is if this country undergoes an absolutely drastic change in its sexual behavior. I mean, we even have to get, I'd say, even more puritanical than the Puritans. Because even when you played around in the old days, at least you didn't have AIDS to worry about. But now the danger is so great that you don't dare do anything. So the only thing you can tell children is abstain. She should have said that the best vaccine against AIDS is the word no, period. That's the best vaccine. No, abstention. That's the best vaccine. No, a rubber is the best vaccine. That's what they're telling our kids, and that was on television, national television, with Dan Rather. I suppose he thinks that's a great idea also. Well, that's what we're dealing with. So you put your child in a public school these days, what in blazes can you expect? If, if the child doesn't become a functional literate, maybe you'll get involved with Dungeons and Dragons. You've got to be very literate. Only the good readers get involved in Dungeons and Dragons. Then maybe you'll become a suicide. Or maybe your child will get involved in drugs or sex. Who knows? I mean, the atmosphere just is not very healthy, is it? And then, of course, there's the problem of violence. The children are at risk physically because now there's an awful lot of violence in the schools. National Review had an article in December on the violence in the schools. Each month, three million high school students are victims of crimes in school, including two and a half million robberies and thefts. 282,000 students are assaulted in school every month. At least 125,000 teachers are threatened with physical violence each month. Half a million high school students say they are afraid in school most of the time. High school students are subjected to five 125,000 attacks, shakedowns, and robberies every month. So there you are. There's the total picture. You put the children in the public schools, they're at risk academically, spiritually, morally, physically. So what do you do about it? Are the schools going to change anything? Can they reform themselves? What are they doing academically? Well, you've just heard that in Topeka you're getting um, Houghton Mifflin. 
rots a ruck. That's all I can say. Houghton Mifflin. Wow. And then what are you going to do as far as the spiritual problems go? Well, they're doing everything. They're still trying to get Christianity out of the schools. Of course, now we've had this big, uh, big book, textbook fracas in Tennessee, and now the schools will soon have to uh, start revising their ways, but we don't know what'll, what'll, what'll come of this. And then the moral problems won't go away. They're not gonna, they can't possibly change much. They can't improve things. I mean, if their idea of protecting the students is to encourage them to use condoms as a solution to everything, then forget it. So the only, the only solution is to remove the kids from these public schools. There is no other solution. To put them in a safer place. Now, of course, if you put a child in a private school of a, or a Christian school, doesn't, that doesn't mean you eliminate all the risks, but you considerably reduce them. Personally, I'm a great uh, advocate and believer in home education. Uh, homeschooling, incidentally, is the fastest growing educational phenomenon in America today. And I'll tell you why it's the superior form. First of all, the children learn so much better. If you've been around homeschooling children, you will you, you recognize how incredibly smart these children are because they are still using that same energy that they use to teach themselves to speak their own language. And that energy is given full freedom at home. Also, the, uh, you get stronger families. You don't get the family alienation that you often get with students in the public schools who are given a, a, a conflicting set of values taught a conflicting set of values. You get stronger families. The parents respect the children. The children respect the, the parents. They're being taught like human beings, not like little animals. And also, another important thing, the parents learn more than the children. That's important to remember. Why? Because remember, in homeschooling, two people are learning. Two people are getting educated. The child and the parent and the parents are really learning very well. Many of them, you know, start out with not much confidence, but then they go to a homeschooling seminar or a homeschooling convention and they read the books on the subject and before you know it, they've become very good at what they're doing. And of course they learn. They feel if they've got to teach their child history, they're going to learn it too. So now we're creating a whole new group of parents who are very well informed, who are really becoming true parents. Also, you tend to cut down on television when you're homeschooling. Much better discipline in the house. And then, of course, the parents become politically aware. Why? Because they realize that their right to educate their children at home, while guaranteed by the, the Declaration of Independence that speaks of unalienable rights, this right is not respected by the education department, by the superintendents, by the uh, NEA, by the KNEA. As a matter of fact, they'd like to do everything in their power to shut down home schools, to prevent parents from, from educating their children. Why? Well, when you remove children from the public schools, you have fewer children there, and so your, your uh, average daily attendance is down, and your, your income is based on your average daily attendance. And also, you can't brainwash these kids. You can't turn them into zombies. So they don't like it one bit, and now parents have found out that they have to go to the state legislatures if they want to affirm their rights and maintain their rights. Now, of course, that is going to require, to take children out of the public schools is going to require a great deal of sacrifice and inconvenience. But now I must remind you that 200 years ago, a group of men signed a Declaration of Independence to give us what we have today. And they went through considerable inconvenience, <coughs> considerable sacrifice to give us this free country. They could not have gotten it. They could not have fulfilled that declaration without those tremendous sacrifices. It was just, it, they had to be made. And as you know, what followed was six long years of war, bloody warfare, loss of life, destruction of property, etc. Many of the men who signed that declaration lost everything. They didn't have to sign it. They were wealthy men. But they did because they believed that it was better to live under God's law than, than the king's law. Now, I'm sure you want to pass on to your children the inheritance 
that we got from our founding fathers. We live in this great, marvelous land of freedom, but we're going to have to fight to keep it free. It's not going to remain free. We have no choice in the matter. They're going to make us fight for it. And so we have to make these sacrifices. There is no possible other way to do it. You see, the humanists only want two things from the parents, from you. They want your children and your money. And if you're giving them both, they're going to win. So we're at, a, we're at a very crucial turning point in America. Parents have got to make serious decisions that entail sacrifice and inconvenience. The Founding Fathers showed the way, they set the example, now it's up to us to follow that example. Thank you very much. <laughs>